So, uh, everybody <coughs> welcome. Um, I welcome all of you on behalf of the University of Ottawa and the Center for International Policy Studies. Um, we are very proud today to present our two main actors um, on a very delicate but very exciting subject on which we don't know enough. Of course, we read, but we have the inside stories, and it would be wonderful to learn, uh, to learn from them. Um, I will introduce the two speakers. Uh, the way we will go is that we will leave at least half an hour for questions, answers, and discussion at the end. So that will be at 1 o'clock. Uh, and before <coughs> that, um, Nicole and Dr. Sakhilwal will be in conversation with each other um, on the subject that you know. Um, uh, I will now um, introduce both of them. Uh, Nicole Raintraub, this is Nicole, is the Director of Facilitation and Mediation <coughs> Support of Ottawa Dialogue, on organi um, an organization she co-founded and built from the ground up into an internationally recognized center of excellence for conflict resolution. She's also a senior research associate at this university, um, <coughs> specializing in international mediation, conflict resolution practices, and security arrangements. Her current work focuses on uh, stabilizing India-Pakistan uh, relations and preventing conflict escalation, particularly in terms of ceasefire management. Well, I was thinking maybe we should have a session on the India-Pakistan relations. And as you know, India, with about a billion voters going to the polls, uh, and the election will be going on for a while. So we hope to see Nicole sometime um, soon. Um, in addition to the mediation and research work, Nicole also <coughs> sits on the uh, steering committee of Equal Voice National Capital Region, where she organizes programming and advocacy activities in support of Equal Voice's mission to increase the representation of women in politics, which should be of interest to us too. <laughs> Uh, she holds an MA in Public and International Affairs from the University of Ottawa and also went to um, Queen's University for political studies. Um, Dr. Omar Zakhilwal grew up in Afghanistan and Pakistan and came to Canada where he attended University of Winnipeg and later Queen University. He then completed his PhD in economics at Carlton University in 2001. So he very much belongs to this city <coughs> and to us as well. Um, Dr. Zakhilwal has held numerous jobs in the Afghan government since the fall of the Taliban in 2001. Uh, he was the finance minister under President Hamid Karzai for five years. Uh, he was a member of the Supreme Council of Afghanistan Bank, um, which is actually the central bank um, equivalent <coughs> to our Bank of Canada. Um, and uh, he is currently advising on the Doha talks between the US and the Taliban Political Commission. And the recently, and re recently he served as the key facilitator and negotiator in the first major intra-Afghan dialogue in Moscow. And so we will know a lot from him. We know a little bit only from reading and review, but we can hear it from the horse's mouth uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. And I welcome Paul <coughs> and Dr. Zakhilwal especially. And let's welcome them. Thank you, Nipa, for that introduction. It's always a bit excruciating to hear your bio read out in front of you. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us today. I hope everybody's had a chance to 
grab some food and uh, we'll get right into the conversation. As Nipa said, we're trying to reserve a healthy amount of time for your questions and answers. When we open it up for that, I hope you'll introduce yourself first before uh, giving us your questions. At Ottawa Dialogue, we've been involved now for a few years in uh, facilitating India-Pakistan and India-Pakistan-Afghanistan uh, dialogue. Uh, and recently, our work has really focused on the process as it is currently underway in Afghanistan and better understanding how um, neighbors, both immediate and maybe in the broader region, can be supportive of those efforts, particularly um, India and Pakistan's role. As Nipa already said, this has been an, uh, an issue which, if you're following, has had a number of headlines recently. And yet, I think that it's still a bit unclear exactly what is happening, where things stand, what the trajectory is looking like um, over the next few months, over the next year. And certainly, there's no way of saying for, certain, for sure which way it's headed. But what I'm hoping, Omar, you can offer us is a bit of an idea of, well, first of all, where things stand presently, and second of all, where you think things are headed. What are the, the possible scenarios we should be keeping an eye out if we want to sort of understand what's happening? Sure. Well, thank you, um, Nipa mm -hmm. and Nicole, uh, for having me here today, and thanks to each and every one of you um, for taking interest in Afghanistan and Afghanistan peace. Um, as I was coming here, I still um, uh, did not know where to begin from. And to be honest with you, even now, I do not know where to begin from. There's so much to be said, um, and yet um, we have about an hour um, so what I'll do is, um, I'll precisely respond to the two questions that they could raise. <coughs> where do things stand with respect to the Afghan peace? And where do I believe things are heading? And then we'll leave it um, to your questions and try to respond <coughs> to those. And that will make my job easier and perhaps uh, will also uh, make um, your being here worth uh, as well. Um, let me say that for Afghan peace, um, this word that we are using um, is not going to be new. Um, the word opportunity. Um, there is an opportunity. These opportunities existed or came to being many times in the past 18 years. Um, um, but uh, the fact that uh, there's still a war raging in Afghanistan means that those opportunities are not utilized. Um, so God forbid this opportunity that I explain what it is um, may also come and go, and the Afghan war may continue. Um, and the reason for that is that every time there's opportunity, there are also threats. There are also challenges, challenges that we fail to manage. And as a result, the opportunity is not taken advantage of. Um, so those challenges and those opportunities, um, certainly, um, starting from 2001, 2002, uh, till this day, um, they certainly differ uh, in nature, um, both within the country and also regionally as well as internationally. In 2002, <coughs> beginning of 2002, when Taliban were defeated, they were ready to surrender and they were ready to be, not even be part of the government, but just be allowed to live. Um, and the Afghan, back then, the Afghan president, President Karzai, agreed to that, but the U.S. did not agree to it. Um, and therefore, that opportunity was squandered. And as a result, um, um, the war on terror um, continued even if, when, when Taliban were defeated, 
um, even when Taliban returned to their homes, even when they seemed not to be wanting to wage a war, um, but raids happened on their houses, um, arrests happened. Guantanamo, again, um, did not help. Bagram presence, and there were, like Bagram, many other presence within the country and outside the country, where people were arrested, some probably uh, because of connections to the Taliban, and a lot not probably. Um, and they went into those presence and came back extremely angry, and they just wanted to take revenge at, it, at the least, or maybe more. Um, so, so the Taliban, um, in a way, no doubt that idea existed, but some of the leadership existed there. But I think the way the war on terror was fought, um, um, that also helped uh, with their ranks. Um, that also helped um, with um, in sort of their cause. Um, and that also helped uh, with uh, the resumption of war in Afghanistan and today in the strength that the Taliban possess. Um, but that's not the only factor. There are also regional factors as well um, that we may come to discuss them. Now, let's um, not go back so much into the background and see where do things stand. Um, the U.S. Um, under the current president um, um, certainly initially started uh, with the <coughs> South Asia policy, um, which um, was um, again perhaps uh, more pressure, military pressure on the Taliban and trying to uh, pressure them to talk through um, um, those uh, means and all that. Uh, quite very frankly, um, that had been tried before. Uh, more bombs um, uh, had not produced much in the past, in fact, had made the conflict more complicated, had m made the conflict more uh, in French, <coughs> and, um, and, and perhaps added more dimensions to it. Um, because with bombs also come civilian casualties, with civilian casualties come disappointments, and of course people who who were just ordinary people, they also pushed them onto their side and, 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 and create certain public support um, to the Taliban as well. So the, the South Asia policy, which again relied more on military um, uh, dimension, was tried, um, but um, but it was not really uh, turning up any results. Um, and it was expected under the current president that it, he did not have a, a long patience for results. He needed to see. Um, um, he listened to the military, but then he gave whatever they needed. So literally a blank check to the military, not only the means, but also the say as to how they carry the war. Before there were restrictions, those restrictions were lifted. Um, so the war was fought more freely, and yet um, it, it, um, uh, it had a counter uh, productive um, results. <coughs> so um, then, of course, um, um, uh, came this um, um, push. Uh, within the U.S. administration, particularly the president, um, that he wanted to end this war. Um, and he appointed um, a former ambassador, um, um, a former special envoy to Afghanistan, an ambassador to Afghanistan, uh, who himself is an Afghan-American, knows Afghanistan quite very intimately, deeply, and has personal interests, of course, in Afghanistan as well. Um, as um, the U.S. and by for peace, um, uh, with again a mandate um, to, to negotiate directly with the Taliban, a position uh, that the U.S. had not accepted um, before. Um, that direct talks with the Taliban uh, were ruled out in all past instances that the Taliban 
needed to talk to the Afghan government first, um, and the uh, Taliban's position was that they wanted to, uh, their position was that they wanted to talk to the U.S. first, because it was the U.S. that they believed they in war with, <coughs> that is the foreign occupation, um, that is the cause of their fighting, so it's, uh, that needs to be settled and only then through intra-Afghan dialogue, the Taliban would uh, settle the internal um, issues. Um, so the U.S. Uh, finally relented, and um, under Ambassador Khalilzad, to talk directly to the to the um, Taliban, um, and the Taliban certainly were bolstered by this, no doubt about it, because finally they had it um, their way. Um, and um, those talks, um, the most serious ones, um, took place. Again, there were interruptions before, but the most serious ones began in um, end of uh, January this year in Doha, first round, and then end of uh, February <coughs> in Doha of this year. Um, the second round was the lengthier one. I happen to be um, in Doha in both both talks, uh, so side closely <coughs> myself. Like I said, maybe I'll, I'll not uh, um, define my role as advisor, but perhaps an assistant to 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 the U.S. Taliban talks because of um, um, the one job that people did not mention that I served as Afghanistan ambassador um, in Pakistan until very recently. Um, so. You know, there is obviously, uh, when you talk about Taliban, there is also Pakistani connection to it. Um, so there, I um, got to know the leadership of the Taliban and interacted with them and I established a certain rapport with them and, and in the issues that is important to them and, and all that. So, um, so that contact certainly and that conversation that I've had in the past three years with Taliban leaders in Pakistan or outside Pakistan has been helpful. So that's, again, uh, that knowledge of, 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 of an acquaintance that I had uh, became relevant to the U.S. And, 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 and Taliban as well because I could, I could meet both sides any time and if there were certain issues of understanding and all that, so certainly help with that or at times advice as well. The U.S. Taliban talks centered on two issues, primarily the U.S. Um, forces withdrawal and also Taliban's commitment to disassociate itself um, completely with foreign um, fighters um, or foreign terrorists. Uh, that includes Al-Qaeda uh, and also Daesh ISIS. Uh, not that Taliban have any relationship with Daesh, in fact, they are their first enemies, but still, the, for the U.S., those two entities are important. They, they are not supported by Taliban or any other faction within Afghanistan. Um, but that alone um, was not enough to the U.S. Um, they, the U.S. insisted in return for progress on that. They solicited and get a uh, commitment from Taliban for two other issues related though. One was an intra-Afghan uh, dialogue um, uh, for peace, um, and within the intra-Afghan dialogue is also a ceasefire, um, because um, I'm sure, uh, because of your interest that you know, in Afghanistan on a daily basis, anywhere from 100 to 200 people lose their lives. Um, uh, to the uh, armed way war. Um, so ceasefire is an immediate um, expectations in demand of the people. Um, um, so those two things. Um, the, the, the first two issues uh, with the U.S., both um, the U.S. forces withdrawal from Afghanistan is something that, in my personal opinion, is, is is um, close to agreement, or probably even sort of the terms of it are understood by both sides to be agreed. Um, the second one as well, um, <coughs> Taliban's commitment um, uh, not to allow or harbor um, foreign fighters in Afghanistan 
is also something that um, the language is, is uh, satisfactory to the U.S. The two other issues is, is uh, we've made some limited progress on. Um, on the intra-Afghan, um, we had um, um, a first major intra-Afghan conference on peace in Moscow on the 5th and 6th of February. And uh, there, um, uh, there was a prominent Taliban participation, but also a broader political participation from the Afghan government, which included former President Hamid Karzai. And probably 80% of the political leadership were there. But um, the noticeable um, uh, element that was not there was the Afghan government, President Ghani's uh, representative. Um, so therefore, um, the government certainly did not like that gathering of Moscow. Um, um, we did get a, a, a joint communique uh, with the Taliban from Moscow, um, which was to an extent reassuring. They committed <coughs> themselves um, to issues that they, um, the people feared the most, um, and they were uh, reluctant to sort of commit in the past, um, that is a commitment to an inclusive government um, that is, uh, has uh, equitable representation from all ethnic groups. There's a commitment to safeguarding the current state or the state institutions, uh, reforming and strengthening them but keeping them. Um, a commitment to, um, uh, to the basic um, um, rights of political rights of citizens, um, a commitment to uh, women rights including education um, and political and social and economic rights, um, so that, uh, a commitment to free press, um, a commitment to um, the adoptions of policies that are in synchrony with modern world, um, so that Afghanistan does not go back to where, um, when the Taliban ruled it to that sort of, uh, uh, so that, um, and certain other reassuring elements. But those were general commitments, um, the devil is certainly in details, and a commitment um, by Taliban that um, to resolve um, the internal issues and reach a political settlement through an intra, an inclusive intra-Afghan um, dialogue. Inclusive certainly meant with the understanding that would include the government as well in the subsequent meeting. And we decided to have our next meeting in Doha. Initially that meeting was scheduled to be at the end of um, March, um, uh, but it was in hell end of, end of March, not so much because of Taliban's uh, reluctance to meet, but because of the differences that existed in Kabul. Um, we wanted the government to come on board um, and, and uh, sort of, um, there was initially lots of differences. Um, certainly the U.S. and other international community wanted this intra-Afghan to take hold um, and certainly pressured everybody to come together. And finally the government agreed to come on board with respect to the intra-Afghan um, dialogue. It was scheduled again for 15th. 14th and 15th of this month, but it's now rescheduled to 19th, 20th, and 21st of this month. Um, at least that agreement in Kabul has been reached. Um, in agreement as to who will go there and participate is still not reached. Um, so there are meetings on daily basis as we speak. Um, there is going to be um, a big gathering, probably the largest uh, that has ever taken place, probably 150, 200 people. Um, uh, 250 would be Taliban and 150 would be um, from Kabul. And this uh, delegation from Kabul will include not only um, political representation, but also women in youth, civil society, um, and others. Um, and the Taliban have accepted um, uh, such a gathering. Um, this gathering initially uh, was to be more ambitious, particularly 
after Moscow in which we agreed um, on, 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 on the joint communique, we need to take it to the next step. Um, um, the next step, the ambitious step would be to probably agree on an Afghan roadmap for peace there. Unfortunately, because we lost time um, um, uh, in Kabul, um, we are not ready for that. Uh, but just this gathering by itself is going to be a significant icebreaker. Um, I think um, uh, we may get something out of it, just maybe not the Afghan roadmap for peace, but in agreement that you will get an Afghan roadmap for peace in our subsequent intra-Afghan dialogues. If this goes well, then the subsequent intra-Afghan gathering should be in less than a month, um, and then this should continue to be <coughs> in agreement. Now challenges, um, let me talk about the challenges, and then of course, um, uh, what do we expect in the months ahead? The challenges are quite so many. One I mentioned is the political divisions within the country, particularly we are going into a presidential election, um, now scheduled towards the end of September. Um, the setting president is also a candidate, uh, no doubt. So he is um, um, by other significant rivals or candidates um, who are running. Um, they do not want the government to be in full control um, because the government will be taking you know, unfair advantage of, of, of this opportunity. In addition to that, Taliban are not ready to talk to the government alone, at least. Um, um, and, and then the government's aim is that it wants to control, um, um, so that it, it has take the credit and second make sure. Um, that's, of course, um, as politicians, they, the politicians would want to remain in power. The, the peace or the progress in peace is not a threat uh, to, to the power. Um, so, so that's one challenge, the election um, that is coming ahead and the differences as to how peace be handled such that it's focused on peace, not that the, the process of peace is taken too much political advantage by one side or the other. So that's one. The second one certainly is um, we are into the spring and summer now. And you must have heard about every year this thing called the spring offensive of the Taliban. In the winter, because Afghanistan has a bit of a harsh winter in the mountainous country, so fighting dies down. In the spring, the Taliban launched the spring offensive. Violence goes up. <coughs> um, the Taliban certainly are um, in a stronger position. Um, and I'm comparing it to the year before, in the year before, in the year before, not so much comparing to the uh, rival forces. Um, so they believe um, if they continue with war, um, again, the, the longer it takes, um, the more they gain they can have, and even if they didn't get to the settlement issue, they will be, be speaking or negotiating for yet a stronger position. So, um, that ambition certainly would push them to um, uh, launch um, um, a violent um, spring offensive. And when violence goes up, then the public and political support for peace um, becomes weaker. Um, that expectations and hope for peace then, then goes away. So that's another challenge because for, 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 for um, peace talks and processes, you need continuous public and political support and, and increasing violence certainly could undermine that. So that's another challenge there. Um, internationally, the U.S. Um, uh, position on Afghanistan is uh, quite unpredictable. Um, so um, you do not know as to what President Trump uh, would be thinking about Afghanistan a week from today, or even a day from today, let alone a month or three months from today. So anything can happen. He can wake up one morning and he could just announce certain things that could be uh, quite dramatic and quite sudden. Um, 
and that the Taliban know, um, and they like that um, unpredictability in a way. Um, that they believe that that unpredictability will advantage them, and that unpredictability will um, certainly be at the um, disadvantage of the government and government forces. So there's another challenge and it concerns everybody, no doubt about it. And then there is the regional um, dynamics. Um, now, um, Pakistan certainly is playing a role, um, in a role that is not very known uh, to its arc rival India, then India, India becomes suspicious. Um, so it doesn't become very supportive of peace. Um, so that's, for example, right there. Uh, you have that difficulty. You then have um, Iran there, um, any um, uh, sort of increasing pressure from the U.S. on Iran, then Iran wants to take it on the U.S. in Afghanistan, um, and therefore that involvement is not predictable as to, to how it goes. Iran certainly has a relationship with, with Taliban as well. Then there is the Russian in U.S., um, at least in the past couple of months, the Russia is playing very constructively. We hope that it remains, of course. China's role is constructive, and we hope that it will remain there. Um, but then there is the, the Taliban's um, presence in Qatar, um, and Qatar trying to show that it is now the player. And when it shows more of its own presence and its own footprint on the Afghan peace, um, Saudi and um, UAE does not like it, um, and so the UAE are also influential regional um, players. Um, so the fear is that they may go to an extent um, that if there is a progress, and if that progress at the end the credit goes to Qatar, the, the UAE and Saudi, we want to, to block it. Um, um, so <coughs> any of these threats actually um, um, could really undermine um, and, and, and make things difficult. Um, and they, each one of them are real threats to peace. So on the one side we have hope, opportunities, um, but on the other side uh, we have all these challenges, domestic challenges, um, and then regional challenges, and then international challenges. If things go well, um, and I hope they do, um, then, then the best uh, way for peace would be, again, a quicker, shorter way. The longer it takes, the more complicated and difficult it becomes. Um, the U.S. seems to be for finding a shortcut. Um, the Taliban also seems to um, support a shortcut to peace. Um, and I could, you know, if you want to know, I'll just do leave it to your questions and, and answers as to why they would prefer a shorter route to peace. Um, so if, and if, if the, um, the regional countries at a minimum do not interfere negatively with the processes, then we could be probably um, um, hopefully, um, seeing some, some real progress within the next two to three to four months um, before election, I would say. And if that progress happens, then election doesn't happen. Because the most likely scenario of a peace settlement would be that the Taliban ask for an interim government, uh, not for an elected government. An interim government that, again, um, is responsible for the revision of constitution because they will be demanding it. They think dream government that is responsible for the inclusion of Taliban into the power structure and also um, the rehabilitation of the ex-combatants or the inclusion of them, integration of them into some of them into security forces, some into others. And perhaps um, uh, the other uh, important implementations, immediate implementations, is easier probably to an interim administration than and then and then within three years, maybe two years, whatever, going into election. Um, that is what our hope and aim is, and that's what we are trying to push as well, um, to find a shortcut. Um, it's possible. 
um, that, uh, that before election, election that um, um, unfortunately in Afghanistan, uh, past elections uh, have not led to a more stable government. Um, they've been marked with um, all sorts of problems and difficulties. The recent parliamentary elections were um, held in um, the beginning of um, end of October, and the result is still not out. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been how many months? Um, so it's still the parliamentary elections are not concluded. That's how complicated elections are. Um, so in presidential elections, uh, become even messier. Uh, compared to presidential elections, parliamentary elections are easier. And a messier election, while you, we are also seeking peace, is going to lead to uh, a complicated situation that's not going to be helpful to peace. So the electoral process, today as it is, is not going to be helpful to peace. And therefore we hope is that peace precedes that and then we go into a situation where again um, uh, we start with Taliban as part of the government and, and, and then of course building uh, the way forward um, to um, an inclusive election uh, in a peaceful Afghanistan uh, with hope that it will lead to a more stable government. Here I will stop. I hope um, um, that uh, Again, it gives you enough of uh, general um, ground or general info for peace that on the basis of which you could just ask for the questions. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to just mention that I'm sorry I forgot to mention um, Dr. Zakhilwa's five years term as the ambassador to Pakistan. Three years. Uh, mm -hmm. Three years? Yeah, 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 three years. Three years. I thought that since the election. No? Yeah, yeah, three years. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, another very colorful position that he maybe holds still um, is the chairman of the cricket board. <laughs> and, uh, along with, and now we have a prime minister in yes. Pakistan who uh, was a cricketer. <laughs> and um, uh, so we hope that the two uh, cricket favorites would get together and uh, discuss uh, the peace process. I, I founded the cricket board, was the chair for a few years, but then no longer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Nicole, if you can start. Sure. Um, thank you for that overview. Super comprehensive and in fact anticipating a, uh, anticipated a lot of where my initial questions were. Um, but as you were talking, I found myself wondering, um, how important do you think public support is for this process to continue? I was thinking about that, especially in light of um, the likelihood that you pointed to that th this might be a very violent fighting season, and that there is this inverse relationship between um, the, the intensity of fighting and, and the degree of public support for continuing the process. Um, how do you provide messaging that can help maintain that, particularly when um, uh, Ghani has been so sort of, um, vocally opposed to the way that the process has been unfolding so far? Can you speak to that? Sure. The public support is extremely important, um, not only for progress in the peace process, but then In agreement is just the first step. The most important phase then is the implementation. Mm -hmm. And if the public support is not there, then how do you implement? How do you sell it to the public politically? And that is why um, the uh, when I was I did not complete my three years term in Pakistan. Let me just you know, reduce it by a few months. Um, I I resigned. And I resigned because um, of my differences with the president on how he was handling the peace process. It has to be transparent. Um, you cannot um, keep um, peace negotiations or peace processes or peace strategies as, as, as a state secret. 
because every individual within the country is a stakeholder. Women need to know what is in peace for them. Um, youth need to know what is in peace for them. Civil society needs to know what is in peace for them. Elders need to know what is in peace for them. Um, in the trust level of the public and the government is not as strong to say, well, whatever the government does, it knows its business and all that. So they need to know at a minimum. Um, but more than that, they need to be involved in it. Um, and, and for that purpose, um, the, uh, in Afghanistan everywhere, maybe, um, but in Afghanistan there's conspiracy theories and there's rumors and all that um, just go extremely quickly viral. Um, and, and, and then sometimes really erroneous information becomes believable and and people then come out and, and quite effectively um, then um, uh, can counter that that practice um, so so therefore I think uh, again in Moscow you mentioned uh, Nepal I did was was instrumental in, in Moscow when we were going to Moscow um, the government opposed it and and asked us not to go, but when we decided to go, um, so they started this rumor that we were there, we were going to Moscow uh, to uh, agree uh, with Taliban on power sharing and, and we were for the collapse of the state and all that. Um, and, and people certainly have seen the collapse of the state um, and how catastrophic that is. We saw that in the in the 90s, beginning of the 90s, people never would want to return back to that. And that really scared the hell out of them. And with such rumors and all of a sudden, you know, it becomes extremely um, difficult. And what we decided was that we will make this, this meeting in Moscow 100% public. That there will be no talks that will be off the uh, off campus. So that everybody who speaks could be. And that helped. That helped. And then we decided that we will get something written out of it. Because at the meeting, at any significant meeting, it is the, the result is the written stuff that you get out of it. And we will just share it with the public. And that is um, the joint communique uh, that we got, some of the principles of which I, I mentioned earlier. So that, that calmed people down, actually. And then they became supportive of the intra-Afghan. Initially, they were very suspicious of the intra-Afghan. Um, if the intra-Afghan, particularly women, uh, if, 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 if a bunch of men were going there and sort of um, giving away everything in return, maybe for some share in power and all that. Um, so that, that becomes important. Um, and, and then violence continues and it may go up but then you, how you play that violence, it could be pl played both ways. We want peace precisely to end this. That becomes one type of a message. But then another type of counter peace message, you, do you want peace with these people? You know, that's they're continually believing in violence and reflecting violence, how can you make peace with them? Both can resonate. But the issue is that how you manage it, and then, and then that's why the unit in Kabul becomes extremely important. The division in Kabul then becomes catastrophic for peace. Thank you. Um, I Another thing I found myself reflecting on was um, some of the, the anxiety that exists right now about the future of democracy in Afghanistan. Um, I take your point that uh, there are a lot of assurances that are being, if, if not established in, in detail, then certainly spoken to in general terms with respect to um, the rights of women and the protections of civil society, political freedoms, and, um, and other related institutions of, or components of the institution of democracy. 
Um, but one of the main things that people think of when they think of democracy is elections. Mm -hmm. So with the current sort of trajectory, which is pointing toward um, elections being continuously on the horizon, um, but receding, how do you sort of make those assurances more concrete when it might not, democracy that is, it might not come in the form of elections anytime soon? Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, first of all, there was a survey done, um, I think it was one and a half months ago in Afghanistan, on peace in elections. Um, it was countrywide, so 6,000 people surveyed. Um, question one was just a simple, do people want election or they don't want election? 92% people said they wanted election. Then there was another question added to it. If there is a choice between election and peace, which one do they want? Sorry, the initial one, 96% people said they wanted election. Second, choice between election and peace, 92% said um, peace. About 6% or 7% said <coughs> election. Um, and then there was a third one, election in peace together was 0.4 percent. Mm. That is the most interesting one. Because the confidence in election to contribute to peace, the fear that the election would actually hurt the chances of peace. Mm -hmm. And that's why there is such a low, lower than half a percentage. Um, then, then in a democracy you have to go by the by what the people want. Um, that's quite very clear that peace is, is what they want, but a meaningful peace, a lasting peace, a peace that guarantees the dignity of every citizen. Peace certainly has costs, no doubt about it. It will restrict lives, but to what extent we are willing to accept those restrictions and what restrictions? We've had intensive, at least, um, not in a formal level, personally myself, um, and um, both in Doha and other places, intensive discussions with the Taliban on the future. Um, I do get a sense that they know, um, well, in some very clear responses and some get a really clear senses to, to, um, to what they believe is possible. Um, I do get a clarity that the return of the Islamic Emirate to Afghanistan is not possible. A, that they could, they could maybe do further gains, no doubt about it. But a complete collapse of the state in their taking over their chances probably are, are difficult. Maybe the international community will not allow for their complete uh, sort of collapse and their return. The second one is, I get a strong sense that even if they can do it, it's not desirable for Taliban to do that, because then they cannot govern. Then Afghanistan will be going into another cycle of violence, in which, again, they had the whole country once, um, in a time at which Afghanistan was totally abandoned by the international community to them, and the Afghan people, at least those who still lived in Afghanistan submitted themselves to the Taliban, and they still could not govern. Then now, with today's sort of um, age and the Afghan population become, have become an increasingly sort of um, part of the global world and all that, uh, 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 they don't believe that it's possible for them to. So that, that gives you they do not show the same type of reaction to democracy in election as they used to. Um, 
So you talk about election and you talk about the lawyer jargon and all that, they don't react negatively to you. Um, um, so, so you see those flexibilities. And of, of course, um, um, what I read to you earlier in the, in the London, um, 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 in the Moscow communique, inclusive government, equitable participation of all ethnicities. I mean, that by itself, when Taliban commit to it, is with understanding that it's going to be through a process. And, and, and what would be that process, other than election and all that? Um, certainly, um, there could be discussion and debates, even not only Taliban, others may tell you that the current system of democracy in Afghanistan is not working. Um, uh, it's, it's not cost sustainable, it is, it is not leading to political stability, it is not, so something needs to be done to reform and change that. Perhaps Taliban could also become part of that. Um, but it is, it is something that we, we do see that there's opening within Taliban to discuss that, um, but there might not be an avoidance of an interim administration um, to, for the implementation of peace and perhaps certain reforms and all that. And like I said, the, gen the general public already shared the result of the, the, um, the survey with you, um, will still support that um, for the sake of peace. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more very quick question and then we'll open it up for, uh, for your questions as well. It's one o'clock. one o'clock. Um, you mentioned that uh, Russia and China have been playing a positive leadership role uh, in this process. And you also mentioned that the, the best thing that Afghanistan's neighbors can do is not carry out activities that obstruct the process. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, are there specific activities that you feel are obstructionist to the process that need to be stopped? And then two, are there positive ways that the neighbors can be engaged in supporting the process aside from saying that they support the process? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we do see no doubt about it. I think um, not so much activities, but again, if certain neighbor is seriously uh, afraid of um, the current peace process that it is um, to its disadvantage, and then, then if they publicly state their position, you can expect that they will not remain in just uh, silent. They must be doing something <laughs> to, to, to hurt the peace process, um, and they certainly have the means to do it, um, if they do decide to do it. Positive way would be um, uh, like what Russia in the U.S. did. Now, Russia and the U.S. still have their differences on a lot of other issues. But in the past couple of months, at least on Afghanistan, um, they, they close their gap. Um, there's more interaction. Um, there is those suspicions by the U.S. of Russia's motives um, and of the uh, of, of, of uh, Russia's uh, suspicion of the U.S. movement has significantly diminished. And this diminished because they started to talk. And in fact, interestingly, this was helped with from within Afghanistan. Um, um, particularly the former President Karzai um, has very close relationship with Russia um, and is strongly pro-peace and all that. He helped with that. Um, uh, the suspicion by the U.S that Moscow um, uh, was holding these events in Moscow to undermine the U.S. talks, U.S. Taliban talks. And uh, then former President Karzai and we, together with him, talked to the Russians first, or to the Americans. What if, if, if the Russians' events become complementary to uh, the Doha talks, the U.S. Taliban? They said that would be positive. We said, well, talk to the Russians then. Um, so, in second, what if, if we hold this event in Moscow, and the Moscow then agrees to the following event to be held somewhere else, not in Russia? They say, well, these are going to be positive. We say, okay, we'll work on it. 
If you can talk to the Russia here, they would be fine with that. So in Moscow, one of the things we did was um, a strong support in Moscow for the U.S. Taliban tax. That was a positive. The decision that the following meetings, before that every meeting had taken place in Moscow, that the subsequent meetings would be somewhere else, and then, then it will continue in some other country, in some other country, so it will not remain there. So that Russian possession of that is, is going to be sort of taken away. Um, um, and that started, I mean, in fact, um, that facilitated direct talks between Moscow and, 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 and the U.S. And even them agreeing in, on the subsequent um, intra-Afghan meeting to take place in Doha. Um, the same can happen with other neighbors. They, India and Pakistan could still have their own differences on other issues, but in Afghanistan they could start to talk. Um, Doha and UAE and Saudi could have uh, their differences on other issues, but at least in Afghanistan they could be cooperative. And the same with it goes with Iran and others. Um, we hope that we get there. Now, one of the aim from, again, if we get our act together in Afghanistan is probably from, from inside Afghanistan to be helpful to bringing the regions to be talking to each other in Afghanistan. At the end, no doubt that peace is the first best for everybody. Um, if they believe that the first best indeed could be that, um, but if they doubt the first best, then they will go for their own second best, which is then not helpful to peace. Uh, my name is Robert Miller. When I retired, I was head of an organization called the Parliamentary Center, which worked in Afghanistan and other places trying to strengthen democratic institutions. That was the, a preoccupation at one time, as you know, is building, strengthening democratic institutions. What you said about this separation of peace and democracy has important longer term implications not only in Afghanistan but in many countries in, in the world. How do you think that will show up if indeed you get to an interim government and then possibly in the nature of government going forward? Well, first of all, I don't call it a separation between peace and democracy. I mean, it's peace in election. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, peace in election. Peace talks well, there has to be a discussion on democracy within peace. If within peace settlement, I said there will be some red lines. There is going to be a cost to it. We need to discuss within Afghanistan as to what their cost. Democracy could not be a cost of peace. Okay. Democracy certainly will have to be a red line. That we have to defend that. <coughs> Deferring elections is not giving up on democracy, mm -hmm. particularly if election is not helpful to peace. Mm -hmm. So therefore, therefore, um, um, going into interim administration, they will defer an election to a later time, particularly when there is, again, certain implementations of peace elements, um, <coughs> is, is probably um, laying some more foundations for a stronger democracy than what we have today. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Florino Reke from Embassy of Romania here. Yes. Uh, as you know, we have a lot of uh, Romanian military troops deployed in Afghanistan yes, for, from the beginning. We still have almost 1,000 there. And I have several questions. Uh, if you have time, and if I don't bother the others, uh, so, my first one is, uh, which is the most important threat to international military forces in Afghanistan now, in uh, these circumstances of negotiation for peace? The second one is, uh, how Afghanistan would look like without the international military forces in both scenarios, having a peace agreement or not having a peace agreement in the next months? You mentioned about the uh, Trump between predictability of withdrawing troops from uh, Afghanistan. So how is your feeling about it? <coughs> Will it be soon or later? Or this year or next year? Your personal feeling about it? 
Uh, you mentioned also about the support in Afghanistan. I'm interested in uh, how much support have the Taliban mm -hmm. in Afghanistan? Um, yeah. Could uh, uh, it's a lot of questions involved, mm -hmm. and Dr. Zakirwal needs to answer. Okay, okay. so I'm finished. So Great. Uh, uh, it's up to him which one sure. he considers that are more important and sure. important for everybody. And um, Andy, after this, and okay. Um, well, quickly. Um, um, the threat is, again, um, uh, um, the, both Taliban, um, in to a lesser extent, the, the, uh, the ISIS, is a threat to everybody's security, including the international. Um, you must have uh, read that three days ago um, in Bagram, um, um, there was a suicide attack um, against the U.S. military convoy, and I think three U.S. Um, uh, military servicemen were killed and some injured. Um, so that threat remains. But that threat is higher to Afghan security forces, uh, particularly because it's the Afghan security forces, they, they, they have a combat role. And like I said, uh, someday it reaches up to 200 people, um, um, anywhere from between 100 to 200 people. Um, what Afghanistan will look like without forces, um, uh, international forces, with, with peace, we'll be better off without international forces because international forces certainly uh, do attract um, uh, uh, or carry motivations um, for, for forces within the country to fight them. Um, uh, to say that Taliban have no cause is, again, um, for fighting is, is an understatement. The presence of international forces is a cause, um, um, whether some support it or some don't. Um, but, uh, but we cannot deny that. Um, I, I wish back in 2002 when the Taliban were defeated um, that the international forces had been drawn out together. We probably would have been better off. And that Afghans were left to make peace with the Taliban. Um, I think democracy would have been more sustainable, governance would have been more sustainable, and I think we would have probably more peace. Um, um, again, the, uh, President Trump's, I think it's anybody's, <laughs> anybody's guess as to what the predictability is. But I, I do believe that the U.S. is serious about, um, about um, uh, forces withdrawal. Um, it will take me back to your question with no peace, um, though I do not believe that there will be a complete withdrawal, but I think there will be probably more reliance on air uh, power, and that air power is not helpful to peace. Um, because throwing more bombs has not helped. Um, it has complicated the war. Um, yes, it, 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 it says the civilian casualties and all that. I've been, even within the government, I was uh, been a long-term critic of, 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 of bombs um, um, and nitrates and all that. Um, so um, it's, it, it probably will take, if, if with no peace, lesser uh, foreign, for, uh, foreign forces, we will have more casualties in, 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 in more intensive war, I would say. Um, Andy? Hi, my name's Andy Thomas. I've been working in Afghanistan for a while. Um, I, in many uh, countries where there's an insurrection or where there's a, 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 a movement like the Taliban, there's a, a, a certain amount of public support uh, because they can't, insurrections do not survive without public support. Um, and when there's been a peace settlement, such as in Nepal and Indonesia and other places, what we find in subsequent elections is that the insurgents wind up getting elected into office because they, they uh, have an attraction. The people are attracted to them for some reason. Uh, how do you see this playing out in, in Afghanistan? Yeah. Uh, my name is Kazim Rizvi. I'm a master's student at Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, and uh, I have a question regarding uh, Pakistan. You mentioned Pakistan's role. So if you have a nuclearly armed neighbor who has a strategic depth policy towards uh, your country, how can you bring a durable peace and stability in country without the changing of the policy in that country. And you mentioned about uh, 
democracy without election, how can you bring a democracy with a selection? Like if you have an interim government then, and no elections, then is it be called a democracy? All right. Um, yeah, the public, first of all, I, I, my personal belief is that one of the fears of Taliban um, is for political settlement is whether it will be able to maintain the same strength politically as it is as its military strength. Mm -hmm. Even during the 90s when Taliban had almost the whole country, when they had the government, they still were a, a military faction. They were not a political faction. Um, they had the whole country and they were not able to transform themselves into a political force. Mm -hmm. And one of my, my advice that I help with the U.S. and talks and all that is uh, that there are certain questions that Taliban will not ask, but it's on their mind, but we need to answer it. How they could be helped, they, they transform into <coughs> a strong political body. That's happened in many insurrections. Yes. The of, transformation from the, the war transformation. to... Yeah. And, and they, Taliban, do not have a clear idea. Their fighters are volunteers. They are there because of a certain cause that has appealed to them. Whether that's a revenge, whether there's foreign force, there are a number of different questions for different Taliban fighters. To them, it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. To some, it's a religion. It's probably a minority. But they still use the religion as a cover. To some, it's a revenge. To some, it's an opportunity. To some, it's something else. Right? Um, but they are all volunteers. And as soon as the fighting ends, then the Taliban, how do they keep them together? Because there's no longer, that cause is gone. Mm -hmm. Their fighting is gone, for which they mobilize them. And they are not politically adept, sort of, they are not politicians, they're mm -hmm. fighters, even the leaders. Um, and that is the toughest question within the Taliban. They don't ask, but I advise our friends, the international and national, they, even if they don't ask, we need to answer that. Right. But we don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, we need to get an answer. I do believe that if they, they, if, if they do turn into a political, yes, they will have. They're electable from quite a large portion of the country. Um, rural Afghanistan in particular. Um, um, you see, in, in war, there is a certain portrayal that you have of an enemy. Um, they are killers, they are terrorists, they are backwards, they are this and that. You have to have that. Um, but the reality is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are still people that are logical, there are still people that you value life, there are still people they connect to people, they are still people, they are interested in power, they are still people, they are interested in life and all that. Um, and, and, and so for that purpose, um, they still have um, local population with them and all that, and the local population will help them. Um, so, so yes, uh, but I'm saying, I, I believe that Taliban um, They believe, well, they do have support, but they, they have some fears as to how to manage that, or how they could be helped to manage that, Translate. to translate and all that. Um, and and Rizvi's, Mr. Rizvi's question, um, democracy without the election. You see, we, we, we started, the current system, we started with, uh, with an interim government. We didn't start with democracy. In end of 2001, in Bonn, it was an interim administration that was formed. And then we convened a wage in June of 2002, and even that did not lead to a democracy. That then formed 
a transitional government for three years. So the interim was not a democratic. The transitional was maybe semi or not even, you know, just a lawyer, but not a, uh, 1,500 people deciding, you know, um, or electing a, a, a president. Um, so, and it was only in 2000, beginning of, uh, well, 2004, that we had the first election. In uh, October. In October, yes, 2004. Um, so, so it's not unprecedented. Um, and then it led to that. Again, with the new settlement and all that, uh, you probably have no other way but then again to begin that but then step towards, towards a fully democratic government. Yeah. My question was also about the Pakistan. strategic depth doctrine of Pakistan well, the, the, and the nuclear arm yeah, Pakistan. Yes. How can you bring a peace without... Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see why they're... Uh, the, you see, the, the, the Pakistan's policies towards Afghanistan, which are not helpful, as not because it's a nuclear power, um, but because... Um, there is a certain history between the two countries, certain fears between the two countries. Um, you know that there is a large population still call, calling themselves Afghans. They live on the Pakistani side. Um, that Afghans have still connections to it. Um, that was uh, during the British rule and all that, that chunk of land was. So, it's, 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 it's not yet settled in the mindsets of Afghans, even though um, um, sort of state-wise and all that, uh, it has been settled. And Pakistan has this fear that, that has had this fear, particularly when, um, when in the 80s um, the Soviets uh, occupied Afghanistan and uh, the Mujahideen, the, the, the refugees, uh, the, the Afghan people uh, took refuge in Pakistan and from there they learned to run resistance. So Pakistan had supported um, that resistance against the Soviet occupation in the communist government, not so much because of its opposition to communist, uh, uh, only a position to communism into the Soviet, but also its own strategic interest in that, that Afghanistan will come under its influence. That this issue of sort of fear from Afghan sides towards its territory will go once and for all. But those policies have not helped Pakistan. Um, what it has done is the byproduct of that has been again um, the, 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 the terrorist elements within Pakistan, the mushroom, and they threatened Pakistan from within. Uh, at one point, some big chunk of the country was under Pakistani Taliban rule and all that. And even today, this image of Pakistan um, associated with those elements and all that has not really helped Pakistan. Um, so again. Me being in Pakistan for so many years, still I do believe that the first best for Pakistan is believed to be peace in Afghanistan. But a peace in Afghanistan with which Pakistan feels comfortable. Um, sometimes the term comfortable is um, um, taken a bit too in excess of that. Pakistan, that maybe we feel completely comfortable if Afghanistan has extremely limited relations with India and all that. But then, after being independent-minded and all that, how could it be? If we call ourselves a sovereign country and all that, why should they be dictated? Yeah. And that is some, something that does need to be discussed between. I, I do not believe serious discussions between Afghanistan and Pakistan have happened on that front. And I do believe the serious discussions do take place that we will find a way forward between the two countries, regardless of whether Pakistan is a nuclear state or not a nuclear state. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, and then the two of you, we have, uh, don't have that much time. So if you could ask short questions. Oh, I'm pretty short, thank you. Michael Craig from Global Affairs Canada. Uh, Canada and the international community uh, have been uh, promoting very steadfastly the meaningful inclusion of women in peace negotiations and in peace building. Um, and there's the question of Afghanistan. Um, in short, is there a place for women? And if so, how do we get them to the table? This is for perhaps both our speakers. Uh, be interested to know what will it look like, particularly in Doha and beyond. 
Uh, we will take the two other questions. Sure. Sure, yeah. Um, yes. So my name is Joshua. I'm, I'm currently a finance student at the University of Ottawa. I'm currently working for the Canadian government in cybersecurity issues, and this, this September I'll be heading over to NATO. Um, I was just wondering, after 18 years, or uh, yeah, possibly 18 years of fighting, and now with this current peace process uh, in play right now, what alternatives are there if these peace talks don't go forward and they end up breaking down? What are the alternatives in the future? And then I am finishing my undergrad here in finance at the University of Ottawa and in the fall we'll be going to Toronto to continue a uh, master's in finance. So <laughs> what kind of uh, contingency plan or perhaps concerns do the negotiating sides have that uh, for example, a situation similar to what happened at the end of the Vietnam War would not take place, where the in that instance the North was giving their assurances that they would abide by the peace process and abide by the treaty, and then as soon as troops, American troops left Vietnam, the South was completely overrun. So you'd stated that there's required commitments such as an inclusive government, a free press, and more uh, Western liberal type ideals that Afghanistan would need to adhere to. So what? assurances and guarantees would there be that once the international presence were to leave, that the Taliban were not to completely go against their word and bring everything back to the state that it was in in the early 2000s. Sure. Uh, and, uh, could you go back to the past uh, a little bit? After the terrorist attacks of 2001-9-11, though Osama bin Laden was known to be in Pakistan, Afghanistan region, uh, the USA chose to uh, take the revenge on Iraq. My question, uh, was Osama bin Laden being protected by the Taliban when he was assassinated by the U.S.? Did the Taliban, <laughs> use, did the Taliban give him sanctuary? Yeah. Sure. Um, Michael, uh, meaningful inclusion of women. Um, but the good news is that the Taliban have agreed um, now they, and in, in <coughs> In Moscow, we had two women, actually. Of uh, 70? Yes. Um, yes. Very, two very vocal women. Yeah. Very but very vocal. Very vocal. <laughs> very vocal. Very vocal. Very vocal. Very vocal. Um, and, and subsequent to that, and there, they did raise some really tough questions. Uh, some really tough questions. And this was broadcasted. Um, and the Taliban responded to um, and the response of, of the Taliban was quite really soft and modest and accommodating. <coughs> um, when I was in, in Doha, um, end of February and in March, and then met the leaders there, we discussed um, the next the subsequent um, in Afghan. And uh, we discussed as to who would be participating. And I said, well, there will be a bigger number of women. Um, and then, and then youth, and then civil society, and then they um, share their concern. What if some of these people are there to just sabotage the talks? And then I said, look, uh, there are going to be tough questions asked, uh, and for right reasons, particularly women and youth. And you, and if you cannot accommodate them here in talks, then how? Can they feel comfortable when you are in Kabul, you know, in the government? And I give them examples of these two women. I say, look, the two women came. You listened to them patiently. You responded. And the reflection has been extremely positive. And this is to, a, uh, to your advantage. There will be people who will be asking really tough, critical questions. But take them as real concerns. And you need to respond to those. Um, and at the end, they agreed. Um, um, uh, that yes, they would be they would be willing to uh, to accept that. As to whether the Taliban thinking about women in women issues have changed at all, it's it's too difficult to to, to predict. To be honest with you, um, I do go particularly in in Doha to visit their families as well. I don't see their women. Um, but I do see their sons. Um, and I try to judge <laughs> as to how the Taliban leader's sons 
are conducting their conversation and all that. I ask about their education and I ask what they like and what they don't like. Interestingly, quite a bigger number of the visits I've had, I run into their sons going to modern education. Traditionally, they went into their own religious education. That also tells you something that within the family some shifts have happened. If they are sending their sons to modern education, then and I ask the Taliban as well whether they are sending their, 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 their daughters to school. And particularly in Doha and all that, the answer almost always is yes, they do. Um, so I don't know how much you could just gather from that. And even with, in Pakistan, when I ran into Taliban, I asked about modern education, their women education and all that. Um, and this response, to um, to Fauzia Kufi, this prominent Afghan woman in, in Doha, of uh, Taliban leaders, I look, we've made our mistakes and we're not going to repeat this. Women can be anything. You can be a prime minister, you can be a, two, you can be a minister, you can be an ambassador, you can be a professor, you can be this and that. And then there were three jobs that he said, you know, no. you cannot be these three. Um, um, one was um, one was uh, an imam of masjid, uh, mm -hmm. leading prayers. Maybe women are not interested in the job anyway. <laughs> Another one, a judge that that um, they deal with capital cases or with uh, with hudud, or with uh, what is it called, uh, awarding death sentences. Sure, yeah. um, other type of judge fine, but awarded the sentences. So I said, okay, maybe there's another thing that women are not interested. <laughs> but then the third one was the president, actually. They say, by Sharif, aside from these three jobs, we had no issues in any jobs. But uh, again, <coughs> maybe that would be negotiable or something. Um, next question, Joshua. Um, what alternative, if, if, if peace um, talks, uh, there's follow -up. There's not much, honestly. I think I think uh, I think we are going to continue to be in a worse situation. I think it's going to continue to be if if no progress on peace starts, it continues war and probably a different nature of war, maybe a dirtier war. I don't know. I mean that concerns us a lot. Um, what type of contingency plans? Um, at least we don't have. <laughs> as to what type of contingency, maybe the U.S. does, I'm sure that the U.S. does, uh, some contingency plans. Um, um, but um, but um, you know, we are there um, um, with hope to make peace work, uh, with hope that, that uh, you know, um, that we resolve this through talks. Um, and then um, I think there was another part of your question as to uh, assurances. Even the Taliban's demand is that whatever even the Afghans agree on, there has to be an international guarantee of it. Um, and interestingly, that's what our women also demand. That's what our youth also demand. That if there's a settlement, there has to be an international um, guarantee of it. Um, so the Taliban's demand and those who fear the Taliban on our side, their demand is the same. That means the Taliban also fear that maybe an agreement will be reached and it will not be delivered upon. So they want some sort of an international event in which there is an international endorsement of it, that there is international backing to this peace plan that it will be delivered upon. Because the Taliban's fear is that as soon as they are not fighting, they are not the same strength. Mm -hmm. So, why would then the terms of the agreement be delivered upon if they are no longer fighting? Particularly their fighters are volunteers after six months. Many of them will go home and just, you know, getting them back into fighting is not going to be easy. So, so that gives you a bit of sort of comfort. Um, that the Taliban want this, we want this, and those who feel the Taliban want this. Was UBL uh, protected by the Taliban? Um, um, I, 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 I don't know. I'm not an intelligence person. Um, we know where he was. He was not in the Taliban held territory. Um, he was in a place called um, uh, uh, Ebatabad, 
uh, very deep into into the Pakistani territory, um, uh, and uh, and I personally would doubt actually if if he had any connections at that point um, uh, with the Taliban. Maybe certain certain contact he had with cells inside Afghanistan. Uh, maybe maybe Al Qaeda cells. There is no doubt that there are still Al Qaeda cells. Al Zawahiri is still alive, still believed to be in Afghanistan, so he has to be in some Al Qaeda cell there. Um, so I'm sure that he had contact with them, but certainly was not under Taliban protection when he was. Um, was was your friend's question answered too? Uh, you yeah, asked yeah, a yeah, question. Yeah. Um, so we probably should end. There are many, many questions that are on people's mind, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, everything has to come to an end, although the process will continue. Um, I, I find most important, uh, most not important, I would say most interesting issue is democracy and election and peace. Um, there is a lot of debate amongst academics on um, whether or not democracy is the best means to get a country exit fragility. And, um, and that issue um, should be focused on. Um, if with autocracy or benevolent despotism, there could be peace and benefits for the people, Mm -hmm. Probably people should go, countries should go for that. Um, uh, this is what I found um, one of the most interesting topics, and you can ponder on it, and also women's issues, and there are several others. Well, the conversation.